welcome back again to ELA Grade 6 for the week of June 1st, 2020. In this lesson, you will analyze several quotes about making choices in life and determine which quote most closely exemplifies the ideas and experiences of one of the people you've read about in this unit. Then, you will draft an argument defending your chosen quote. You will consider the meaning of each of the following quotes. These are available in your packet. Over the course of this unit, you have gathered information about the experiences and choices that others have made that help them on the pathway to adulthood and achieving success. Now let's consider each of the four quotes provided on the next two slides. Life is a matter of choices and every choice you make makes you by John C. Maxwell. The choices we make every minute of every day can contribute to making someone's life a little bit better or worse, even without intending to by Chikamso Afobe. Big changes don't have to be hard, but they do have to start with a choice. This is where real change begins, where you start taking control of your life and how you choose to live it. This is where it all starts by Natalie Thompson. The universe doesn't give you what you ask for with your thoughts. It gives you what you demand with your actions by Steve Maraboli. Think about the texts that you've read in this unit and the people you've studied. Use the notes and work you have completed from previous lessons. Analyze each text to determine and answer the following. Which quote most closely exemplifies the ideas and experiences of one of the people you've read about? Elements of an argument. Now that you've decided on one individual you've read about and the quote that best exemplifies the ideas and experiences of this person, you are ready to plan an argument. You have learned about argument earlier in this unit. We know that claims, reasons, evidence, and a strong conclusion are pieces of a solid argument. Now we are going to enhance our understanding of argument further by participating in the collections level up tutorial elements of an argument. In this tutorial, you will learn to identify the basic elements of an argument, claim, and support, to recognize counterarguments and understand their purpose to distinguish between emotional and logical appeals, to recognize commonplace assertions. A movie trailer that introduces audiences to the latest action-packed blockbuster, a newspaper editorial that discusses the problem of pollution, a political speech that unveils a new policy proposal. What do these have in common? They all use the power of persuasion to convince you to do or believe something. Persuasive writers and speakers use all kinds of special techniques to convince their audiences. But to really be effective, a writer or speaker needs to have a strong argument. At the heart of any argument is a claim or a writer's position on a problem or an issue. A writer must prove the claim by providing reasons and evidence, also known as support. Click the phrases below to see examples of claims. A claim usually appears at the beginning of a persuasive text or speech. The claim is supported by evidence and details that appear later in the argument. Clean up laundry detergent is the best detergent on the market, so that would be a claim in an advertisement. In a political speech, I'm the candidate who is most prepared to tackle the difficult issues that our company community faces. In an editorial, a policy that bans cell phones from school grounds will cause more problems than it will solve. And a claim in a lecture, volunteering will benefit you as much as the people you are helping. When analyzing any persuasive text, examine it closely to identify the claim. 
Ask yourself, what does the writer want me to believe or do after reading this passage? Which sentence states the writer's claim? Our community center is in dire need of improvement. Residents have been complaining about it for months. To begin with, much of the equipment should be replaced. The children's sport gear is falling apart and the exercise equipment is outdated. Also, the swimming pool needs to be repainted. So here, the claim is really in the very first sentence. Our community center is in dire need of improvement. And the rest of the sentences support this claim. A writer must support a claim with reasons that answer the question why. For instance, a political candidate must argue that he or she is the better person for a position. As part of the argument, the candidate should offer reasons that answer the question, why am I a better choice than my opponent? Click the images to read reasons for the following claim. I'm the candidate who is more prepared to tackle the difficult issues that our community faces. My plan for community improvement will be more effective than my opponent's plan. I have more experience than my opponent. Evidence is specific information that is used to back up a reason. Below are five common types of evidence. Click each type of evidence to learn more. A fact is a statement that can be proved true. Quotations are the documented record of someone's comments about a topic. An example is a specific instance that illustrates a general idea. A statistic is a fact given in number form. And an anecdote is a brief account of an event that can be used to illustrate a point. Each box below contains a different type of evidence. All of the evidence supports the following claim and reason. Claim. Clean up laundry detergent is the best detergent on the market. Reason. Clean up laundry detergent can handle tough stains better than other leading brands. Drag the label that best describes the evidence. If you need help, click on the box for clues. Alrighty, box one. A credible national survey found that 75% of households believe that cleanup can handle tough stains better than the other leading brands. And because that number is in there, 75% on a survey, I'm going to say that that's a statistic. Second, are you tired of tough stains that refuse to go away? I've read seven rowdy boys and cleanup is the only detergent that I trusted to take out those tough stains. Ava Robbins says, well, and that's a quotation directly from Ava Robbins. And the third, Tia Hale was strolling outside in her white linen dress. A car roared by, spraying mud all over her. Cleanup got the stains out. Since this incident, she will only use cleanup. So this is an anecdote. It's an event that helps support the claim. Which evidence below best supports this claim and reason? So the claim, a policy that bans cell phones from school grounds will cause more problems than it will solve. And the reason? Such a policy would upset parents who depend on cell phones to stay in touch with their children. So the evidence here that I think works best is that 60% of parents surveyed said they would be upset if their kids could not carry cell phones. So this does support both the claim and reason. To strengthen their arguments, some writers use counterarguments. A counterargument acknowledges an opposing viewpoint and then counters that viewpoint with further reasons or evidence. Click the images to read a counterargument in action. The writer mentions an opposing viewpoint. Many school officials maintain that cell phones cause too many distractions, often preventing students from paying attention in class. The writer counters that viewpoint. Allowing students access to their cell phones doesn't have to lead to distractions, as long as certain rules are established. Phones should be on silent mode, and students shouldn't be permitted to text in class. Writers enhance their arguments by using persuasive techniques, 
or methods designed to influence readers. Two common types are emotional and logical appeals. Click each term to learn more about it. Emotional appeals use feelings rather than facts to persuade. Writers use strong words to tap into feelings of sympathy, fear, or vanity. Whereas logical appeals use sound reasoning and facts to convince readers. Use the exercise below to test your knowledge of emotional and logical appeals. Decide whether each sentence includes an emotional or a logical appeal. Drag the sentence into the right box. Without our state-of-the-art security system, robbers have easier access to your home. So that makes sense. That's more logical here. Oh, no. Oh, okay. So we're corrected. This sentence appeals to readers' fears by preying on their sense of security. Second, if we widen the road, rush hour traffic jams will be less of a problem. Let's try logical here. And yes, it does use logic to prove a point. If the village does not receive medicine, hundreds of innocent children will suffer. And the terms innocent children will suffer makes me think it's an emotional appeal. Okay, so we got one wrong, but now we understand why. Let's move on. In developing an argument, a writer may make the mistake of using a commonplace assertion rather than true facts to prove a claim. A commonplace assertion is a statement that many people accept to be true, but is not necessarily so. Often, it is a generally believed idea about life and human nature. As a critical reader, you need to be able to tell the difference between facts and commonplace assertions. Click the image to see some examples. So here's a fact. According to many studies, sleep needs to remain constant throughout adulthood. But a commonplace assertion is the older adults get, the less sleep they need. Read this part of an editorial. Which sentence is a commonplace assertion? It's a good idea to develop that deserted strip of shoreline as a dog beach. Two, about 60 families in the area own dogs. Three, Dogs need to roam the great outdoors. All right, so the assertion here is sentence three. We often think that dogs do need to roam the great outdoors. It's a generalization. Read this claim. The Sandiana Resort offers a memorable vacation. Which supporting statement is a commonplace assertion? Drag it into the box. The resort offers scuba diving lessons and fishing expeditions. Now and then, it's important to get away from it all. The Sandiana Resort has a massive pool with hundreds of lounge chairs. The island is home to several resorts. So these three are really giving us facts. This is more of a commonplace assertion that it's important to get away from it all. An argument is made up of a claim and support. A claim is a writer's position on an issue or a problem. In a solid argument, reasons and evidence help to prove the claim. To strengthen an argument, a writer may include a counterargument, which acknowledges and then counters an opposing viewpoint. A writer may also use persuasive techniques, such as emotional or logical appeals. A writer may fall into the trap of using commonplace assertions as support for an argument. A commonplace assertion is a statement that many people assume is true, but is not necessarily so. Wow, that was a lot about argument. We now really have a good understanding of the elements of an argument. Now go to the Show What You Know section of your packet. You are now ready to plan your argument. You completed this organizer for a different argument in an earlier lesson in this unit. After completing the Drafting My Argument Organizer, you will be prepared to write your argument essay defending your choice in the next lesson. And that's all for today. Thank you for joining me as usual. And next up, we will be reading an informational argument article and then decide if the author thinks that it is difficult for teenagers to make a decision.
So have a great rest of your week. Stay well, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Hello, and welcome back to ELA Grade 6 GT for the week of June 1st, 2020. In this lesson, we will analyze a Shakespearean monologue in order to interpret the monologue and provide stage directions for how it should be performed. Remember that a monologue is a long speech by one actor in a play or a movie. Here is an image from a scene in Taming of the Shrew, a Shakespearean comedy. We will analyze the final monologue of Kate, one of the main characters. The play is about a young lord, Petruchio, who marries a spirited woman named Kate because her father offers him money and property. Petruchio tames his wife by depriving her of food, sleep, and clothes until they come to an understanding. In some interpretations of the play, Katharina is tamed and follows her husband's orders. In other interpretations, Petruchio comes to realize that Kate is his equal and they both come to realize that they can work together to have an equal relationship. In other interpretation, Kate makes fun of Petruchio and is sarcastic when she pretends to be tamed. In still other interpretation, Kate goes crazy at the end of the play. The monologue that ends the play. At the end of the play, Petruchio bets some of his other hus of the other husbands that his wife, Kate, is the meekest. Petruchio wins the bet, and Kate lectures the other wives on how they should have to behave toward their husbands. In some interpretations, Kate delivers a last monologue sincerely. In others, she delivers it with hatred. In others, she is sarcastic and humorous. And in still others, she delivers it as if she has gone completely crazy. When different actors take on certain roles in Shakespeare, they frequently jot down notes to help them perform. Because Shakespeare's plays include so few directions, actors and directors often have to create their own. Here's an example. If we interpret the play to mean that Petruchio and Katerina become equals, the stage directions for Petruchio might look like this. They are in parentheses on the slide. Petruchio taking Kate's hand and kissing it gently. Catherine, I charge thee, and he winks. Tell these headstrong women what duty, and he coughs, they do owe their lords and husbands. As you can see, stage directions might include actions, facial expressions, Vocalizations, sounds that the actor might make, as in the, the previous slide when we said he coughs. Volume and tone of voice. Movement of arms, hands and body. And possibly working with props or objects on a stage. When we interpret what is happening in a play, we rely on connotation and denotation. Connotation is an idea or feeling that a word invokes in addition to its literal or primary meaning. Denotation refers to the literal meaning of the word or its dictionary definition. Let's review a collections level up tutorial to gain an enhanced understanding of these terms. In this tutorial, you will learn to tell the difference between denotations and connotations, to identify positive, negative, and neutral connotations, to analyze how connotations affect readers. All words have meaning, and you can find the meaning of a word in a dictionary. The dictionary definition of a word is its denotation. For example, you might say that this teen is daydreaming. He's imagining what he'll do after school. Many words also have connotations, or meanings that go beyond the dictionary definitions. Connotations communicate the ideas or feelings associated with a particular word. Writers often use connotations to convey positive, negative, or neutral feelings.
For example, the teen is now asleep. You could say he took a break or he slacked off. Took a break sounds more positive than slacked off. Drag the definition or denotation that best fits each set of sentences. We're going to do the first two here. And remember, we're looking for the denotation or the more or less the dictionary definition. So Max tried to blank the parallel bar, but his grip loosened. Children blank to their parents when they are afraid. And in this case, the word cling fits here as the very literal meaning of the word cling. Let's look at the second one. The man placed the plant in a blank part of the room. The student sat on the tree-covered blank lawn to study. Here, the word shady fits best because this is fits well into these sen two sentences as a very literal meaning of the word shady. So let's move on. Writers choose their words carefully when they want readers to feel a certain way. That's why it helps to think about exactly how connotations are affecting you. In each boxed example, click positive or negative to describe the connotation of the bold-faced word. Let's take a look at the first one. Julie's screechy voice drove everyone from the kitchen. I'm going to say that was negative. Let's see. Yes, yeah, screechy is not pleasant. Second, the powerful blare of the trumpets echoed through the stadium. I'm going to say that that's a positive. Powerful is a positive way to describe the sound of the trumpets. And then that last one, the ear-splitting sound of the sirens alerted everyone to danger. It's the ear-splitting sounds negative. It's an unpleasant sound. Words can also have connotations that are neutral. Words with neutral connotations create neither good nor bad feelings in readers. Decide whether each word has a neutral connotation or a positive or negative one. Hey, Gabby. Most people do not like the idea of being called Gabby. And outspoken, hmm, that's a tough one, but I don't like to be known as outspoken. And talkative, that might be kind of neutral. Okay, everybody talks. Connotation is also used to convey shades of meaning. The words slender and scrawny both have the same denotation, having little fat. However, these words have different connotations. Slender has a positive connotation, but scrawny has a negative connotation. Click the images to see examples. Jason maintains his slender frame by doing gymnastics. Joseph needed to lift weights because he was scrawny. Since feelings can range from mild to intense, word connotations can express varying degrees from very positive to very negative. Move the slider below to see shades of meaning for the word pride. So here we have the most positive. The word self-admiration is positive for pride in these examples. Kelsey was filled with self-admiration after she won the state championship. It's okay to feel good when you've done a good performance. Now let's see something a little more negative. Amy's high grade on the math test made her feel a little self-important. That is, until she failed the next test. Self-important is another word for pride, but it suggests a feeling of superiority over others. So that makes it a little more negative. And very negative, everyone calls Jason conceited because he constantly brags about his looks, possessions, and accomplishments. So conceited is not a positive for pride. By making different word choices, writers can change the meaning of words and how readers feel about those words. Click each word to finish the sentence. How does each word change the feeling behind the sentence? So as entering the kitchen, Cal noticed an odor. He noticed a stench. Cal noticed an aroma, and Cal noticed a fragrance. In the previous examples, Cal detected a smell when he entered the kitchen. 
The words given in those examples, however, carry different connotations for the denotative meaning of smell. Click each word below to find out more about its meaning. Odor is unpleasant. Onions have an odor. Stench is even stronger. It's repulsive, and trash has a stench. Aroma is more positive. It's appealing, like such as baked bread. And fragrance is pleasant. Vanilla has a fragrance. As you've just learned, some words have negative or positive feelings associated with them. These words have meanings similar to lenient. Which word has a negative connotation? So lenient, easygoing, that's positive. Relaxed, pretty good. Weak, hmm, let's see what the other one is. Moderate. I'm going to say that weak has the most negative connotation for lenient. Most people would not be want to be thought of as weak. Now, use what you've learned about connotations to practice with another set of related words. These words have meanings similar to eager. Which word has a positive connotation? Is it impatient, enthusiastic, hasty, or fanatical? I'm going with enthusiastic. And it has positive feelings associated with it whereas we don't want to be thought of as impatient, hasty, or fanatical. All words have specific meanings. The dictionary definition of a word is its denotation. Words can also have connotations, which are ideas or feelings that have positive, negative, or neutral associations. Connotations can express shades of meaning or a range of feelings. For example, the words content and ecstatic both mean happy but ecstatic communicates a greater degree of happiness. In this we now have a thorough understanding of connotation and denotation, and this will help us as we read Kate's monologue at the end of the play. So we are ready to read that now. The monologue is available in your packet. As you read, Pay attention to the connotative and denotative meanings used for some words and consider the different interpretations. Has she been tamed? Is she filled with hate? Is she being sarcastic or humorous? Or has she gone crazy? After reading, you will need to choose an interpretation. All right, now we're going to be adding some stage directions. So this is really the fun part. You're going to add stage directions to two portions of Katerina's monologue. Remember your choice of interpretation from the previous slide or the try it section of this lesson. Review Petruccio's sample stage direction in the learn it section. Imagine what you see and hear as you read to help you determine the stage directions. You may want to create a chart like the one here on your own paper to complete this activity. So this you'll do on your own and have fun and share this with someone in your household. And that's all for today. Next time we will be doing a wrap up of Shakespeare. Thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you next time. Stay well. Bye bye.